we're going to talk about how we get started and what you should know about getting into uh, fractional business. I've done a lot of pivots in my life. And, uh, you know, now that I've been, you know, in the business world for, you know, 45, almost 50 years, I, uh, I, I hope I've learned a little bit. So please, uh, I think the most important thing is we're lifelong learners. In the last two years, I picked up a CVA and a SEPA certification, not because I wasn't doing the work, but because I really wanted to learn what other people were doing. And I really enjoyed both of those processes. So certifications aren't re ne necessary, but I just believe they really go a long way in helping you understand how other people are doing their work. Um, quickly, uh, uh, Dan mentioned this is interactive. I'm a I'm much better discussion leader than I am a, a, a lecturer. So uh, you can do it, you know, don't, don't hesitate to um, throw something in the chat. Brendan will be watching the chats for me and we can stop or we can, um, you know, we can have questions and answers as we go along. So please engage. And yeah. I meant to, I meant to mention, I'll add a comment in here. We have, we, this is a small enough group. I mean, it, it's a relatively large group, but it's small enough that people can feel free, unmute yourself and blurt out yes. your question, you know, wait for Mark to finish his sentence. But uh, if you have a question or a comment that's relevant to what he was just talking about, blurt it out. Yes, please. I, I, you, you won't offend me at all. As a matter of fact, you'll give me a break. Um, Really interesting in our poll here. Uh, it's about 50 50. 50% 50 mm -hmm. of you are, you know, a little more than 50% of you are A and B. And then we have a lot of fractional people um, on the other, you know, 49%. So very interesting. Um, I think uh, that just bodes well for people that are in the fractional business trying to learn and how to do things better. Uh, this is a little bit geared towards people in A and B. But I think this is things I'm going to talk about. If you're in the business, it's never too late to start again and rethink how you're doing your business. So hopefully this will be valuable to all of you. And um, I have to start out with a disclosure in that I'm totally biased. Okay. I totally believe that fractional should be the first choice in your career, not the subtle for choice in your career it gives you you get to do work you love you, you can make good income the flexibility and stability and i just briefly stop on stability so many people think of, of w2 as stability and really what it is is putting all your eggs in one basket you know uh if i lose a client or if a client moves on i only lose 20 percent of my income and i don't have to start from scratch and spend a year six months, 18 months looking for another job. So I totally believe that fractional is the most stable career choice you can have. And I think the ability to say no is probably the greatest power that fractionals have. Fractionals, if you're if you have a client and you're and they're just not performing or you're not getting along with them, it's really nice to just excuse yourself, maybe make another maybe make another um, introduction to someone else that might help them, but there's no reason for you to put up or do things that you don't really want to do because there's such a demand for what we do. Um, Mark, so it's interesting what you said, because the way I got into this was I was the CFO of a publicly traded company from 2005 to seven. And when I left, it was the worst job market. So I ended up setting up the hybrid practice and I'm, too old to reinvent myself every two to three years. So right. I set up two to three days a week fractional and then tax returns, typical CPA practice alongside of that. So I didn't have to do that. And, th and that's exactly the flexibility. I do multiple things, just as you explained, Ruben. And my life is 15 hours a week doing my transition consulting practice. The rest, other things, I, I I do things like write freeway to fractional, which we'll talk about. That, you know, Brendan will will deny this, but she said, oh, it'll be easy, Mark. We'll just do this in a couple hours. And, we, you know, two years later, we really have a good product, but it was great fun and it took a lot of time, but I had the flexibility to do it. 
And then I also do projects with, that I call our, our lottery ticket projects, which if any of them ever hit, they're going to be really high, high value, but they're low probability. So I'm out there just taking swings at startups and things like that, all of which I love to do. So I agree with you uh, 100%, Ruben. And we're going to start here just briefly right at the beginning. And if whether you're in fractional now or if you're thinking about starting it, I really need you to start. What would you do? What, would, what work would you love to do and most forward look forward to completing every day? Okay. What would that work? What would that look like? I, I can use myself as an example. I tried lots of things. I, I picked up a CVA thing. I'll just do valuations. You know, a year and a half into that, I'm going, man, that I just don't want to do that. This is just, just too much detail work for me, and at least personally, and I love st strategy. So I pivoted to working with business owners and helping them develop their transition plans. Typically, that's a two to five year process for clients, and I get to become their best friends, their made their 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 advisor. It's work that I love to do. The relationships, working with family members, it's fantastic. So I really think that. Yeah, I think um, Jeannie mentioned that she was stressed and that she had to work all this overtime. Well, first of all, I never work for free. If I put an hour in. It's either in my, it's either in my monthly retainer or I get paid hourly for it and I get paid handsomely for it. You shouldn't be working. We, you know, this is sort of a sidetrack, but just going back to Jeannie's comment, you know, if it's stressful and you're not getting paid for all your time, you're probably not doing the right thing. And, you know, we need to talk, step back and think about that a little bit, but I'll just comment on that real quick, Mark, yeah. if you don't mind. Not at um, all. We had a different model, I think, and we were working with small companies, uh, uh, one to five million in revenues at that time, which would probably equate to, you know, maybe up to 10 million today, but uh, was very hands on. And um, the one thing our, all of our clients had in common was um, they were all in trouble. Mm -hmm. And they were not looking to sell or do some kind of transition like that. Many of them were uh, family businesses, and that was a big problem. Um, so it was it was a very different model, and uh, it worked. It worked, and we did do a, a retainer oh, basis, monthly retainer. But and I was remember I was more like the worker bee. It was my first right. job outside after my MBA, well, uh, so I was willing to put in the time and the hours because I had a fabulous boss. But that's uh, great. Well, you know, I loved your 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 description of time shared CFO, which is really what a fractional is. So I love I I've never heard that before, and I really appreciate it. It's been, you know, I I, I can use that. I'm gonna use if it's wait wait wait. You better talk to Brad Howe about that. The, <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> I'll ask him if you can use it. Okay. Okay. Well, I still think it's a, a a very good example or a good description of what we do, and we're not talking in depth about what that is today, but it really is selling a fraction of your time That's to right. people that can afford a fraction, you know, of your pay uh, because they don't need a 300, they can't afford a $300,000 person. Right. But they can pay you 60, $70,000 a year. And, you know, if you have three or four of those as a, right. well, those are people you love, right. To work with, it's really not hard to go to work anymore. So really, um, uh, all of you, if you get into this and you have stress, if if the stress is hitting you, you, you know, please, please give me a call because I've done it and I've done everything wrong once, which makes me an expert. So uh, thank you so much for that. But really what I, I really want you to do is really come back with how satisfied would you be if you only serve people that appreciated you doing the work you love to do and were paid well for it. That is what fractional provides an opportunity to do. Not saying it's easy at all, but I think the more important thing is what would you, what would be on your not to do list, right? So many of us get into being a fractional and we end up balancing people's checkbooks. And we want, you know, we hate that. And we want to get $300 an hour or $200 an hour, and that's not worth it. You're doing the wrong thing. 
right? I mean, you can set up a fractional business doing controller and bookkeeping work. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're a fractional CFO, you're building systems, processes, and people, not balancing checkbooks and running reports. Does everybody see the, the difference? I mean, the CFO of a company isn't the controller and not the bookkeeper. And so many of us think we have to do that work in order to get a fractional job. Now, we may have to do a little of that, but if it's a majority of our time, we're, we're, we're probably didn't sell our, we didn't sell the right services to our employee, to our clients, because we end up doing things we don't want to do. We're not doing strategic work that's high enough to afford our salaries or justify our salaries. So I really want you to consider what you end up and how you develop your business. And it should be around that high level strategy, CFO work, redoing cash flow, um, building systems, processes, and people, as I said. Whatever it is that you love to do in that as a CFO, it's great. Uh, and it reminds me of a little story of a FANG meeting about, oh, maybe nine years ago, and we were going around the table and everybody went, you know, what do you want to be? And our little was part of our intros and everybody said, well, I want to be a CFO. And it came, it came to me and I said, well, I don't want to be a CFO. And they go, well, Mark, why not? And I said, well, I'm just really tired of making good, having to make good numbers better. You know, I just, it's just too much work. I mean, it's too stressful for me. So I don't want to do that. Right. I mean, I want to just deal with people that want, I mean, I, I can get really creative with, you know, accounting rules and tax rules. And I just, I got burned out doing that. So that's something I didn't want to do anymore. So, you know, think about what you really want to do and what you, more importantly, what you don't want to do. And you might want to drop a few things in the comments of things that immediately come to mind of what you wouldn't want to do. Hey, Mark. What, yes, one I was going to say, um, so having spent most of my career in Silicon Valley, um, one of the things you get classified as, and I am one of them, it's called an operating CFO, an operational CFO at the strategic level. And I think rather than just closing the books and doing the accounting and meeting with the bankers and all this other stuff, you want to be more involved with the strategic direction of the corporation. And so what I've done is because I've done 12 turnaround assignments, I've either you know, fixed the company, liquidated or sold it. Um, they're looking for somebody who's a strategic person rather than just somebody who's a book bookkeeper uh, or a CFO that has no operating experiences. Most of the CFOs I've come across don't have any operating experience at all. All they know how to do is do forecasting and planning and bookkeeping and AR and, and, and so forth. But coming in, focusing on the strategic aspects of cash flow and everything else as looking at it being, in other words, being at the CEO level. To me, right. that's where the value is. So in the Bay Area, guys that do what I were doing were making between five and 700 an hour. And I think that's kind of exciting. That kind of work is really the key as opposed to be looking at it as just as a bookkeeper kind of a concept, even though you say you're a CFO. Right. And I will agree. I think that there's a huge, especially in the size market of Kansas City, if you really look at, if you really analyze the jobs that are considered CFO positions or titled that, they're really just controller jobs, okay? Yeah. They really are, and there's a huge, you know, misperception of what finance is versus accounting. And you know, I always say, look, there's two different departments in most universities, accounting and finance. They're totally different. And you have to develop those skills if you started out as an accountant, and you do that through experience and you work your way up to a CFO, or you become a CFO that is really a controller and you just keep doing the same work over and over and over again for 20 years. And you think you're really a CFO and you're, you're really not that. So I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. It's just figure out what your job is. It, there's nothing wrong with being a fractional controller or a fractional um, uh, M&A &M person or different things. If this is the stuff you love to do, that's what you should be selling yourself as. You know, the other part remark to that, that I'd just like to add to that. Sure. There's also an issue between the communication of the buyer and the seller. So if I'm the seller, the buyer, you have to clearly have an understanding. What do you mean by CFO, et cetera? And that's a problem because they don't, a lot of them do not understand yeah, 
the no rules clue. of what they are. Right. And so if you can't, you've got to baseline that before you get started. If you don't, you're, it's a lose-lose proposition. Right. You know, a lot of times I have to come in and help. The first thing I do with my clients is help them build that org chart and get a controller in there and, and do that. But I'm still not doing that work. And it yep. hurts because you want to jump in. You really can't do that much without good, without good <clears throat> books. But you, that's not your job. Your job is to build those people processes and, and systems for them and help them do it and, and make them sustainable without you so that you can stay at that strategic level. Yep. So I, I really want you to think about that. But I want to move into, you know, how do you start uh, your CFO practice? Fractional CFOs. And there's really two ways. There's number one is to do it yourself. And we're going to talk about that in, towards after I talk about joining a group. And, you know, a, there's a lot of, C, there are some phenomenal CFO groups out there. Focus CFO with Brad Martin. And we had somebody here as part of that group. What a, what a phenomenal organization there is there. But why, you know, why why do people why do most people join we're going to handle these really quickly why most people join groups remember you're leaving a job i'll come to that and how do you decide with so many great groups out there okay so let's just start with why people start joining a group anybody got an idea why most people join a group bloat it out all right most of us are afraid to sell deep down. In groups, most groups have a have a way to uh, not all, but most groups have somebody out there being a rainmaker. And if you understand the sales process for professional services, it's really not that hard to do. But this is why people join. Right. Number two is some groups have great training and coaching, and that's fantastic. You know, you get a lot of support, and that's a good thing. And uh, there's also, you know, they they handle the details, right? So those are all great reasons to join a group. And and there's groups that do that very well. You don't have to do anything. You just show up and do your work. And, and that is, you know, for example, Brad, uh, focus CFO's process. They've got market leaders that do the sales and they've got people in the back office that help you with your admin and you go in and you spend a day or two a week with your clients and you make really nice money. There's not, it's a fantastic opportunity. Okay. But I do have to mention there's no free lunch. You know, they're making money. So 30, so up to, you know, 50% of the money you're making is going to the group. So again, nothing wrong with it. You can make really good money, but remember that's out there. And um, this is the thing that I really want to help everybody with. Don't trade one job for another, okay? This is your chance. There are groups that give a lot of flexibilities or other groups that don't. There are groups that are totally exclusive. You can only work for them. You need to understand that. At the end of this presentation, we're going to, uh, there's going to be a link to, a, I think it's 30 questions that you should know before you join a group that I recommend everybody download and understand the, that if you don't know these answers, it shouldn't be a six month discovery after you sign up. You need to understand them and their, and 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 um, and their culture and make sure it fits. And if they're going to stick, if if their jobs are sticking you on controllers' jobs and you still make fifty thousand dollars a year on each job and you're happy to do that, that's a fantastic opportunity. Okay. So again, take the time to look at both sides of this and to look and really understand the group you're joining. Okay. Do, do you do you really want to work there? Okay, so and anybody experience bad bad groups or bad consulting firms they've worked for in the past? Working 90 hours a week and getting paid for 40? <laughs> How about that? I, I did that. I mean, I, I was at KPMG for 10 years. You know I was working a lot. <laughs> you know, um, worked at Duff and Phelps for a couple of years doing valuations. I, I know what those 
those are great organizations, but they're going to, you know, do I, would I do it again with, in hindsight? Probably not. You know, it's just a lot of work, a lot of, uh, it didn't fit the culture. So make sure you do. Okay. So where do you start if you want to do this on your own? Okay. And um, I'm going to go with, the very basics. And you really need to know this, whether you're going in a group or not, but if you're on your own, it's really focused because nobody else is selling you. Okay. Define your value proposition, get to revenue and don't get lost in the administrative details. Okay. And we're going to, those are sort of the highlights of what we're going to talk about a little bit, but uh, I do. Mark, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, but there's not a enough. question in the chat room. Oh Yeah. Uh, it's from uh, Marvin Estrin, and he's uh, basically asking, what are the liabilities of being a fractional CFO, uh, insurance-wise? Okay. Well, you probably should have professional uh, liability insurance, and that's very inexpensive. And you really have to make sure your contracts are very well done. And I'm not an attorney, but you you know, there are ways to limit those liabilities that are in your contracts. You just need to make sure what you're signing up for. And, you know, probably should have an LLC to give yourself a little bit of protection. Although I can argue that that doesn't do much if you're doing fraud, because uh, you are the officer and there's officers liabilities that can look through those things here. I, I said, I'm not an attorney and I'm starting to rattle on about law. So I apologize, but uh, you really, um, need to cover your basis from the insurance and contract point of view. But I will also tell you that if somebody, I mean, you can work with somebody for a few months and know what they're like. And if you think they're the kind of person that would throw you under the bus, maybe you shouldn't work with them anymore. That's probably your biggest protection on those kinds of liabilities. And, and be fair with your billings and do what you say. And, and uh, you know, you're qualified. I guarantee it. You're qualified to do what you're bringing to the table. So does that answer your question? Hey, hey Mark, I was also talking about the financial aspect. So say you're a CFO, you're on the website as CFO of a company. And then an IRS says, wait a minute, you're the CFO. Now you've taken on certain personal financial liabilities. How do you limit that type of exposure? Well, again, you're not working for that company. You are for them. You're you're a contractor. Mark, so, I would disagree with that, at least okay. in California. Okay. You're an officer of the company. I would say you have to, you probably should have a W two. Well. And that's a, that's an issue I always get into because I, I, I like to be the W two if I'm going to be listed because as an employee that does give me some, you know, a liability protection. Well, I, I can't an answer that question, honestly. Uh, I'll, I'll put it on my list for the next talk. But hey, Mark, real yeah. quick, it, it might be a good delineation that if you are a fractional CFO and you are not signing any legal documents or banking accounts on behalf of the company, um, that sidesteps your personal liability. However, that said, your recommendation of forming an LLC and simply getting DNO insurance is a, is a good backstop. I, I would agree. And yeah, I'm not, I'm not a, a, a true officer of the company. So Reuven, I don't know how they would look through that. Uh, I can't really answer that. I, I apologize if that's, you know, important. No, 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 I just wanted to bring that up that, you know, there, there are issues, especially in California. Yeah, and, and again, every state's a little different, but I've never really thought about it, to be honest with you. I mean, that was the first time anybody's ever asked me that question, and I am going to talk to some of my attorney friends <laughs> to make sure I'm not leading people down the wrong path, because I don't really know the answer to that, guys. I really don't, okay? But that's a great question, so thank you for asking. And there's probably things that you can do to balance uh if you determine that you may have liability, there may be ways you can be sure that the company's D&O insurance will cover you, even though you may not officially be 
you know, whatever it is that may give you that liability, uh, there may be ways to, to, to get that protection. And as right. you alluded to before, Mark, it's, I mean, you know, it's, it's important what you put in the country, you know, there's, there's hold harmless clause clauses. There's, there's, uh, you know, you, you can either have, you can either be subject to, uh, to uh, the company coming after you for, for different kinds of things, or you could put clauses in there that basically say, you know, these, these, and these kinds of things I have no liability for. And the company has to acknowledge that if they're going to sign your contract. I, I could, I think that's your biggest protection. The, the insurance is very, very inexpensive, at least in Missouri, maybe even California, because there's, you know, more traps, it may be a little more expensive, but I definitely would recommend that. I would definitely recommend you have an attorney review your contracts so that you know what's going on in your state and what the issues are, you know? Uh, so that's what I've done, okay? So uh, when you, on your own, you need to realize, you know, the rainmakers make the money in most firms and you are your own firm. So that's that extra money is gonna go in your pocket. And I also want to say that you don't need a huge network to start your business. Okay. People get scared about that. If you have a value proposition and, you know, we actually taught, teach a concept called the uh, peer group of one conversations. And we sit down with people and ask what their problems are and listen to them and do marketing research and understand what, if there's really a market for your value proposition you, you really can get to revenue very quickly. And uh, we, we'll talk about that as we go through this. But again, I'm just going to go back to slide five. If you build a business doing stuff you don't like to do, shame on you. It's going to take a lot of effort to build your fractional business. Nobody said it was easy. So you might as well build one that you enjoy doing and working with people you enjoy working with. Okay, and then you really have to dig into what your value is. Okay, and I, I will, I will absolutely, you know, I get on my soapbox here a little bit. You get into you get into a networking group or around people, and they go, well, "I'm a fractional CFO," and we think that means something to the market, right? It really doesn't. Your value is not what you do. Your value is what your clients experience, okay? So in my case, the value I bring is helping people, business owners understand the options they have to transition their business, the value of their business. And if they're in a family, to make sure that those relationships are handled properly before, after, and during the transition. People understand what that means. I'm a fractional CFO, but that's what I do. That's what I love to do, okay? Does that make sense to everyone? We good? I mean, I want to kick people under the table when they say they're a fractional CFO. I'm, I've, it's probably the only time I clinch my teeth um, in, in, in almost any meeting. What do you do and what, what, what you know, I, I say if my aunt can't understand it, right? <laughs> it's not a really good definition of what I do for people. So define that value proposition and then get out in the market and talk to people that are there and see if they agree with your value proposition. Find out if they have the problems you want to solve. Because we create this hypothesis of what we think a value proposition is, and then we go to market and nobody buys it. Well, we probably missed it, okay? And that's what you do. How do you know there is a market for your, your service, the thing you made up in your mind? You know, when I negotiate against myself, I always win, right? Uh, it's that kind of thing. So I, if I thought, man, there's, a, there's I have one idea. I can make a lot of money doing valuations for SBA lenders. Not true. They, they don't, they pay the minimum amount. There's too much work and there's guys out there that'll do them for a quarter what I can even break even on doing them. So that's something that's not going to be profitable for me or not something I don't want to do 500 of these and make 
you know, a thousand dollars on each one every year. That doesn't fit what I love to do. So, you know, go out there and figure out if, you know, the sooner you figure out there's not a market or you don't want to do it, the faster you will get to revenue. Okay. And I, 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 I really, you know, want to get to this quickly here. Um, I love business startup checklists. I love the fact that this guy put go get clients down at the bottom. We flip that on its side. We flip that on, upside down. We basically believe that you need to get to revenue first. Okay. You need to get to revenue and not get lost in the details. You know, when you get to these, some of these groups where you talk about CFOs, they, everybody's patting themselves on the back. I set up my website. I've got my LLC in place. Well, those are really cool things and important. But if you're not at revenue, and it, you're, all you're doing is it's make work. It's, it's stuff you can tell your spouse. Hey, honey, I've done something today. You know, it's not really getting to the heart of the issue. We say, basically, that you don't have a product until two or three people have pay, are paying you for it. So go back. Let's go through those steps again. Identify your, identify your value, the thing you really love to do, and why it's important. Go out and talk to your network that are in that industry that you want to serve and make sure you've hit it, right? And then... By, by being right, you'll get referrals to work. And oftentimes the people you're talking to say, you can solve that problem, I'll hire you. And you get to revenue very, very quickly in this very, we teach this in Freeway to Fractional. I can only just touch on it briefly here, but you need to get to revenue before you go out. I've seen people spend thousands of dollars on websites and branding and then never sell anything. Big parties, big kickoff parties, and they miss the market completely. So hopefully I'm making this, this is a very, very important part from my perspective. And, and if you're in the fractional business already, it's never too late for you to go back and say, this is what I want to do. Let me go check out if there's a market for it. And start selling that and start weeding out or getting out of businesses that you don't want to work in or doing things you don't want to do. Don't, don't, don't dump your clients, but you know, you can nicely transition, either transition out of that work and up into the stuff you like to do with the same client, or if there's not an opportunity there, replace them. Do the things you like to do that pay the highest amount of money for what you love to do. Like I, I, I sort of repeated myself here a couple of times, but it's very important, very important for us as we're, as we're building our fractional business, not to dread having to go and sit at our desk and crank out stuff we don't like to do. And we don't get paid enough or, as much. Okay. These administ I'm going to say this again, the administrative details are important, but they're not number one. They're, as a matter of fact, I see a lot of people repeating again, using them as a way to avoid getting to the first thing, which is getting to revenue. Anybody questions, understand that, comments? Okay, guys, that more or less is what I had to say tonight, but I've got a few for today, a few things to say. And I, I love to say this, you are in your own business, but you're not alone, okay? And you need to start building relationships with other fractional service providers, okay? Not just financial service providers, but human resource service providers and operations service providers and IT service providers so that you, when you get into a client and you identify these projects, so many of us think, oh, I don't do that. So, you know, I'm not worried about it. 
and they blow over it or they uh th or worse they try to do it themselves because they you know we're financial people we can do anything and you really want to bring in other people that you trust know and have impeccable skill sets and and reputations to work with you in your client base well and the other thing is there's a, a very specific side benefit from that which is they will then be thinking of you in the future you're absolutely they're right so yeah cross-selling i mean when i left duff and phelps this isn't exactly on point but they sort of let go of all of us hard workers at the same time and we wow. got we got together and picked up a third of one of their biggest clients and we got paid really well because we 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 banded together to so to put a project together right and we knew the people because we were in there with them yeah so it was it was an easy sell and none not one of us could have done it on our own and you know so many times we're in and we go man we need a supply chain person and we we're not supply chain people so we don't do anything about it well bring in your friend First of all, they'll probably give you a little commission if you want it, okay? But you're also probably going to get paid to manage that project mm -hmm. because your your owner would have taken care of it if they had time. They, so you understand the process here. So I, I really want you to start doing that as you are in your frac building your fractional businesses. And the other thing that I love to say is that we have a stop by my office every month, the third Tuesday of every month in the afternoon, Brad Martin, the founder of uh, Focus CFO and I, and we talk about these types of issues. And this is where you're gonna meet people to, to network with and build, uh, you know, build rapport. Sometimes you, you know, you just need somebody. I have friends at uh, B2B CFO, when I have some issues, I, you know, we're buddies. I call them and say, hey, how would you do this? Right. And, and they're always very generous in helping me and vice versa. When it comes to transition, I help them. So, you know, start building the network of and, and coming to these meetings and learning about the fractional business. And we're Mark, we something, something's worth clarifying. You mentioned about, we have a, uh, uh, stop by my office. I think you're referring to Matt Bud's Feng thing on that, right? Well, Matt has one, but we also have one. Oh, you have a separate one. Okay. Yeah, Matt has one, and he deals a little bit from more his perspective. It's more of a consulting interim. Because you've been on his, I know. Yeah, I've been on his, and I, I try to participate there as much as I can um, just to see what he's talking about and make sure we're in alignment. But yeah, he does one, and then Brad and I do one. We tend to be a little more um, uh, maybe a couple steps down the road further than some of the stuff Matt talks about in his. Okay, we've we've got a whole we've got a whole um, a whole uh, agenda for this year. I think is going to be very very cool, including one on social media, what's working and what's not which is later in the year. It's going to be a very, very cool. We're having a friend speak at that. That's deep into uh, social media. Uh, so, and we talk, we talk about sales and we talk about what, you know, we get to the basics and drive down about how to build, you know, should you be a, a, a retainer based or should you do hourly or how do you do that? And there's all type, we talk about all these issues that'll allow you to re- assess how you're doing your business or how you want to do your business. Okay. So you're not alone here. We have a lot of fun. I do think, you know, uh, I think that this, the financial executives networking group is slowly becoming the fractional executives networking group, but Matt doesn't like that when I say it, but <laughs> we are really banding together and helping each other build our businesses. And I really invite you to be part of that, whether you're in it or thinking about it, you'll keep getting more and more information. And then, you know, what next or now what? I, I will offer a couple of things uh, based on our freeway to fractional um, uh, resources. The first one is a, a joining a group checklist. If you're thinking about in joining a group, 
you really need to check this out. Uh, all the questions you should ask. How do you get paid? Can you sell? Are you exclusive? It goes on and on. But if you don't know the questions to ask, you might miss them. If you ever, I've done this. I I made it assumptions about what vacation time looked like when I joined jobs. And I missed it in my contract because I didn't think to ask it because there were so many other things that I was doing. It's sort of the same thing. Don't miss these important questions when you're interviewing. So I highly recommend everyone look at that. And then we also have a, a short course. It's called Five Days to Fractional Bootcamp. And it's all online. Brendan, are you there? She may have left. Um, this is the link to that class. And it's just an intro to what your experience could be as a fractional service provider, okay? And we would love to have you uh, check those things out. And uh, you can always contact me. I'm in the FANG uh, database, but I, I hear, hear my contact information on the slides. And those slides will be coming out to everyone that participated in, signed up for this call basically. And then we're also recording it. So uh, we'll figure out where that stuff's going to be posted, okay? So I'm, I've covered up a lot of how to start. There are so many things and practices and your questions were really insightful and, and gave me some things to think about. So I appreciate that. This is a very, very, uh, intimidating group to speak to. I really uh, appreciate all your backgrounds and your abilities. And I will end with my statement and then I'll take questions. I truly believe that fractional is not just a trend, but it's, it's here to stay. It's how business is getting done. The kids, the millennials get credit for it, but it's benefiting us, people like me, more than them. Because we have the experience, there's a huge information or knowledge gap out there that they just don't have and they need our help. And we can do this in such a way that we have freedom and flexibility to build phenomenal businesses as we, as we need more time for our family and friends. We've already done our share of 80 hour weeks. So highly recommend you look into it. Uh, we have a class called Freeway to Fractional. Uh, I'm not here to push that, but if you want to know more about it, just let me know. Any questions, Dan? Any any redirects? Anything we can do? Well, I have a question. Um, as a this is Andy Hollingworth, as a hey, startup, quasi startup, um, I got my first client by accident. Basically, a president contacted me and asked me to help him. Okay. Um, what's the What's the major way to get new clients for a quasi startup? Is it basically just networking? I think that it is, is, yes, it is defining exactly what you do for people as their value and then talking to your peers in the industry. It is networking and making sure that you understand what, you know, in networking, so many of us get together and have coffee and feel good that we had a networking meeting, but it's really market research. What's going on in your company? What do you see happening? I see this. What do you, do you agree? I, I think people need a solution for this. What do you think? Do you, you know, what's, what was your solution? What have you already tried? Those kind of conversations are valuable for you and Again, what we find is that, you know, after that first call, you say, hey, let me put together a few thoughts on that. And, you know, maybe we could do another call or a coffee or another, you know, it can be Zoom or Google or whatever. If you'd give me another few minutes to talk about potential solutions that I could bring to this and help me understand if this is something the market would want. And it will, that is the type of networking that will lead to business not just having your cup of coffee and saying i'm a fractional cfo who do you know 
Sorry. So what? So besides the Fang, what groups would you typically look to join? Oh, wow, wow. I'll I'll tell you. It depends on what you're doing, right? I mean, Many. if if you're, for me, I want to be around the wealth managers, right? Because they're the ones that have clients that need transition plans, and they don't have a clue what that means. So I can help them help their clients. Hmm. There are manufacturing groups um, out there. Uh, we have, what is it? Uh, Kansas Solutions, um, whatever, Manufacturing Solutions. They're an MEP and they, 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 they serve all the manufacturers in Kansas. If you want to serve Kansas, you want to get to their events, right? Um, I don't necessarily think I probably make somebody mad, so I won't say this, but I will, I guess. I'm, I've made people mad in the past. I don't think it's going to Chamber of Commerce meetings. It's, you know, try, it, those aren't necessarily target-rich environments for you, mm -hmm. okay? So figure out your target-rich environment and get there. I absolutely think that if there's a group of people that are getting together that are fractional CFOs in your area, you should build relationships with them. Because sometimes they come across stuff they aren't going to do. They don't Is want that a question from Andrew. Yes, Andrew. You know, so you're in San Diego, or you know, effectively in San Diego, and don't forget. Uh, and Tom Lindemeyer, I think, is still here. Don't forget Judy Thompson's biweekly networking events uh, newsletter, which is somewhat unique. Uh, uh, Mark, this is a uh, Tom Lindemeyer's partner, Judy Thompson, many years ago, before I got to San Diego as a way of giving back to the community. She's a financial headhunter. So okay. way of giving back to the community came up with this biweekly events newsletter, which it's certainly not all, but a big portion of the professional groups networking meetings each month are listed in there with a description and a website and all that stuff. And Andrew, I would say that's a great source. You know, once you figure out where you want to specialize, that listing is a great place to look for groups that would be likely to have your targets as attendees. Oh, thank you, Dan. That's a, that's a great idea. And also in San Diego, you have the CFO Roundtable uh, with, um, you know, it's now what, Marsh McLennan? With Hal. I mean, that's a great place. And message me or contact me if you need information. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to just mention a couple of things we did at Financial Managers um, when I worked there in Boston. My uh, my my boss, the owner, was was very savvy with uh, connecting with many many people, and um, he had been uh, a Harvard uh, University administrator, so he knew a lot of people who knew people, and he wrote letters to um, uh, the. Uh, the newspapers and I, we had a great article about our, our company in the wall street journal and <laughs> you can believe it and in ink magazine so this was i guess um newer back then so it may not warrant an article in the wall street journal anymore but uh we we got a lot of clients uh just from that free uh free advertising uh, there you do have to be a good schmoozer and get out there. I didn't have to do that too much, fortunately, because that's not really my forte, but he was really good at that. Um, did you have a comment on that, Mark? Because I have yeah, a couple I was questions say, you for don't you. Have to, you don't have to be a great smoozer. You just have to have a lot of enthusiasm and passion about what you're doing and people will buy it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's good to have a tagline or something like his was, my briefcase is my desk. <laughs> and, you know, and, and that was, I believe, one of the, the bylines on, on um, uh, the Wall Street Journal article. But um, I have a couple questions for you, if that's okay, because I'm interested to hear how you manage your business. Not that I'm, I'm going to be going back into this, but I just think the idea is really interesting. It was, um, so I want to know how long do you actually uh, retain clients? What's your average um uh, length of time with clients. And then I'm just uh, amazed to hear that 
you said, I hope I understood this right, that you only work actually on the client business 15 hours a week. So I was wondering how many clients do you usually have at a time? Right. Well, there's first, I'll, I'll do these it's sort of the way I remember them. My clients are three to five years most of the time. Some of them will never go away. And you know, I'll have to, you know, this, I've tried to leave and go on to some other things. And that was a big mistake. That's the other thing that we could talk about at some other time. As a fractional, people are going to try to hire you away. Don't do it. Stick to your guns. Um, I, you know, I'm a bit older, right? I don't need to make a lot of money. My house is paid off. My kids are out of college. They you know, they have their own careers. So I only have to make, you know, $120,000, $30,000 a year to pay my bills. So that's why it doesn't seem like that many hours. Matter of fact, I did my budget based on 40 months this year or 40 weeks, not 50. You know, and, and to be to make my nut, I have to work 15 hours a week for 40 months, 40 weeks. Okay. So it comes and goes, it's not perfect, but that's the way, you know, and, and the reason is not because I'm sitting around doing nothing. It's because I'm doing other things I love to do that have potential to make money and do make money. So my fractional business is only a part of what I'm counting on. And uh, did that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I don't know Thank if I you. covered them all, but yes, Gene. Appreciate your questions. Guys, this is what I said. This is the business to be in. Next August, I grew up north of Detroit on a beautiful lake called Lake St. Clair. I'm working there all month. Mm -hmm. Nobody cares where I'm at, right? You know, I, it, it, my office isn't my briefcase. I have clients that have never been in their office. Because COVID did that for us. The, you know, if there's one thing that came out of COVID is people don't, I can, you know, I'm such a great deal if I'm working on the coast. <laughs> because I don't need to make as much money as you guys. You know, I mean, my billing rate at, you know, 250 is nothing to you guys. If I, you know, honestly, if you're really doing fractional CFO work, you need to be in excess of that. If you're doing controller work, a couple hundred bucks an hour is pretty darn good. Okay. Nothing wrong with that either. Okay. Or you, you know, so you, the big, big issue to sort of follow, you know, follow up on the answer to Jeannie is do your, the most freeing thing you can do is do your budget and figure out how many hours you really have to work. Any other questions for Mark before we uh, let him go? Dan, I was going <clears> to, <throat> this is Jean Latou, I was going to offer up a suggestion for networking with business coaches. That's yeah. been a great source of referrals to me because they often go into an organization and they figure out what needs right. to be fixed and how quickly it needs to be done. That's and right. oftentimes <laughs> that is, that definitely is the financial arena. So, yeah, I mean, team up with people business coaches hr people um it people that's a great source and they're happy to do it because they can't solve it they don't even know what a balance sheet is they don't care okay but they see it's an issue that's really the magic of networking and working together on things okay so um I don't, I, I want to, I don't remember our timing, but I think we're getting to the end. So uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Okay. Um, about anything. If you want to know more, we can do a, you know, I'll, I'll, send, I'll probably send you a link to my calendar calendar and say, here's a 30 minute uh, conversation about fractional. Happy to do that with you. Uh, want to tell you, I, you know, I'm, I'm very excited about Freeway to Fractional and what, what that is. So I, I encourage you to check that out. And um, it, it, there's a LinkedIn page for it. Okay. We, we, we believe that most people, if they do what they're saying, what we teach, will get to revenue before they finish the class. 
no guarantees, but I'm, that's what happens when people do the work. So we not an easy thing, but the best thing you could possibly do for yourself 